All right, let's talk about Dwight D. Eisenhower's presidency. So Truman is no longer, or well, he's going to step down in office. And you have Dwight D. Eisenhower taking over in the next term. So Dwight D. Eisenhower's presidency, a continuation of Unit 10. So Dwight D. Eisenhower's presidency. Good so far? Ready? Okay. So we're talking about Dwight D. Eisenhower's administration here, and let's look at the election. In the election of 1952, the Republicans, they nominate Dwight D. Eisenhower. And in that election, they also up, uh, nominate Richard Nixon to be the vice president. So again, Dwight D. Eisenhower is nominated by the Republican Party, and the Republicans also nominate Richard Nixon to be his vice president. On the Democratic side, why isn't Truman running another term? He didn't run for two terms, technically. He ran for one re-election term, and what was his first term? Why couldn't Truman run a second term? Yeah, because he served the remainder or the majority of FDR's term. Remember that? Because if he served three years of FDR's term, if he runs a third term, he'll have, he'll have served for 11 years, which you're not allowed to do. And so he was cut to that uh, two-term limit. In any case, the Democrats nominate Adlai Stevenson here. And uh, so you have an election between Eisenhower and Adlai Stevenson. Do you think Eisenhower is pretty popular? I would say so. I mean, what do we know him for already? What did he do that was so important to American history? Yeah, he fought during World War II. He was a supreme allied commander during the Normandy invasion. So just like Andrew Jackson, George Washington, Ulysses S. Grant, he's a what? He's a war hero. He's a huge war hero. He saved the world. And so that's definitely going to work in Eisenhower's favor. Now, the one thing that won't work in Eisenhower's favor is that there is a controversy over Richard Nixon. Nixon was accused of having a slush fund. He was accused of having a slush fund. Nixon was accused of having a slush fund, which is pretty much like a secret account uh, from donors where you spend on personal things. And so he was accused of having a slush fund. And the problem with having a slush fund, this secret slush fund, was that people said, so are companies giving you like a million dollars, and then if they give you a million dollars, are you giving them contracts and you know, passing laws in their favor? That's what it looks like, right? If you gave me a million dollars and I didn't tell anybody, or I'll give you an example. Let's say a textbook company gives me a million dollars. And then next year, I'll be like, you know what? We should probably change our textbooks. Now, you assume that I'm changing textbooks because I think it's better for the school. But if you found out that that textbook, gave, textbook company gave me a million dollars, now what would you think? That I was what? Bribed. And so there's an assumption that uh, Nixon has been taking bribes, whatever else. And so he has to make sure that he dissuades people from believing that. So Nixon gives the famous Checkers speech. Checkers, by the way, is his dog. And so he gives a speech <coughs> announcing his innocence or arguing his innocence and saying, I want to do that. I'm a, I'm a man who loves his family, and I'm a man who loves his dog, Checkers. I remember... When me and my family and my wife, I mean, you know, it was a humble beginnings. You know, we, all that money we raised, I mean, I remember when I got back from the war and me and my family and my wife, you know, we had a dog, Checkers. I love playing with that dog. And, uh, you know, life was good. And, uh, you know, we didn't have very much money. I played with my dog, Checkers. It was good times. The American people are like, oh, the man loves his dog. I mean, <laughs> who are we to say that he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a terrible person? So the Checkers speech actually saves the campaign. The checker speech ends up saving the campaign because otherwise, Nixon looked really bad. But by giving the checker speech, he kind of humanized himself in the public eye. People thought, oh, that's a, that's a nice guy, this guy. Likes his dog. I like that. I like that a lot. And so he humanizes, he humanizes himself in the public eye, and they, they decide to vote for him. And so you have this massive We Like Ike campaign. You guys should know that Eisenhower's nickname is Ike. So the We Like Ike campaign begins, and uh, a lot of people start, you know, 
going along with that. We like Ike. You know, that's a pretty fun campaign slogan. And so uh, here's that campaign slogan. We like Ike. Imagine if they had election campaigns like that still, where instead of like saying, Barack Obama is killing people, and Mitt Romney is giving jobs to China. They were just singing, and I was like a musical. Life would be better if campaign slogans were like musicals. I'd like that world. But that's not the world we live in today. But nonetheless, uh, campaign slogans across the country get people to vote, and you think Ike's going to win here? I think so. Ike wins with the landslide victory, five or four to forty-two to eighty-nine. Four forty-two to eighty-nine. He wins a large majority of votes here. Four forty-two to eighty-nine. So he wins nineteen fifty-two election. Four forty-two to eighty-nine. And I should also note, get it out of the way, he also wins his re-election campaign in nineteen fifty-six. Four fifty-seven to seventy-three. He beats Adlai Stevenson again, but again, four fifty-seven to seventy-three good so far cool and thus making Eisenhower the 34th president of the United States but I put 34th so I'll make sure that's 34th and not 33rd president of the United States Dwight D Eisenhower serving from 1952 to 1960 so we're in the 50s guys 60 years ago. People were alive at this time. You know people that were alive at this time. Our parents are going to be born during this era. Maybe some of your parents. Assuming they're the same age as my parents. But yeah. We're getting close. Next week will be in the 1960s. And the following 1970s. Crazy. Okay, so let's talk about Eisenhower's Cold War politics. Let's talk about his foreign and domestic politics. How is he going to address the foreign policies, uh, either the issues dealing with the Cold War. How did Truman address the Cold War? What was his major foreign policy, Truman? What was Truman's overarching foreign policy, guys? What did he want to do with uh, co uh, communism? Containment. So Truman was all about containment. Remember that. Truman was all about containment. He did Marshall Plan. He did Truman Doctrine. He did NATO. He did all those things, OAS. He did all these things to contain communism. Eisenhower will not do the same thing. Eisenhower will do something a bit different. Eisenhower will seek to promote a different kind of foreign policy. And that foreign policy will be drafted or molded or created by this man, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles is the architect, that's a good word, the architect of Eisenhower's foreign policy. And of course, Eisenhower has to agree to it, but he's the one who convinces Eisenhower to change this policy of containment. And John Foster Dulles becomes the architect of Eisenhower's foreign policy. So what did this foreign policy look like, you might ask? Well, he had two major goals, this architect of Eisenhower's foreign policy, John Foster Dulles. His first goal was to liberate Eastern Europe of communism. He wanted to liberate Eastern Europe of communism. And this is what we like to call rollback. Rollback. And in particular, he wanted to roll back the Iron Curtain. He wanted to roll back the Iron Curtain. Roll back. Roll back the Iron Curtain. So again, Truman wanted containment. 
How is that different from rollback? What is the difference here? Lanieri? Okay, containment stops the spread, but what does rollback do, Carla? It tries to get rid of it. So there is a difference. Under containment, we just try to prevent it from spreading. Under rollback, we're trying to get rid of communism. And so you're rolling back the spread of communism. Not only are you saying it's, you know, we don't want to spread any further, but are we trying to eliminate communism? So there's a key change here. Rollback is trying to get rid of communism, especially in Eastern Europe. And he wants to do it through pressure and propaganda. Now, pressure obviously means military pressure, but propaganda is going to come in the form of what? Media. Yeah, media. Now, you have Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. We're going to be sending ideas of democracy and capitalism across the Iron Curtain. But again, you have this notion that if we can just send these ideas across the Iron Curtain and say, we will fight for you. We will protect you. If you fight against communist aggression, America will have your back. So are we trying to encourage these countries to become independent? Are we trying to encourage these countries you know, to, to fight for democracy? We're trying to get them to fight for liberty and freedoms. And we're sending those ideas across the Iron Curtain. Because again, we want to roll back the Iron Curtain. We want to roll back communism. Good so far. Is this more aggressive than containment? It is. So is this going to make the Cold War hotter or colder? It's going to push us closer to war, right? Because we actually are willing to push a lot further back. Then there's massive retaliation. That's his other foreign policy goal. Massive retaliation. And massive retaliation, here's his foreign policy. Any Soviet or Chinese aggression, any Soviet or Chinese aggression would be countered with a direct nuclear attack. Any Soviet or Chinese aggression would be countered with a direct nuclear attack. Let me explain what this means. <laughs> Any Soviet or Chinese invasion would be countered with a direct nuclear attack. So, if you push, or if you poke me what is the appropriate response on my part? I poke you back. If you push me, what's the appropriate response on my part? I push you back. You draw a sword, I draw a sword. You draw a gun, I draw a gun. Does that make sense, folks? It's appropriate response. What he says is, if you poke me, I'm going to kill your entire family. But that is the argument. You know, if you send a tank to invade, let's say, West Germany, how am I going to respond to that one tank? A nuclear weapon all over Russia. If you send a plane to bomb our embassy, I'm going to nuke all of Russia. If you kill three of my soldiers in combat, I'm going to kill every single citizen in your country. That's massive retaliation. Is that an appropriate response? No, but the hope was, if we're saying, if you touch me or push me in any way, I'm going to kill everyone. What does that make us assume is going to be the reaction of our enemy? What do we assume you're going to do then? If I say, if you do anything to me or my family, I will kill everybody. What do I assume you'll do then? I assume you'll do nothing. So the whole goal of massive retaliation was to prevent any aggression. Because, folks, a nuclear weapon should not be responded with a nuclear weapon. Sure. But should shooting a guy in the leg by accident be re responded with a nuclear weapon? Absolutely not. But America says, look, I don't care. If you rub me the wrong way, I'm going to kill everyone. That's the way it's going to be. Massive retaliation. The hope was that it would prevent any aggression against the U.S. or its allies. Because, again, are all of our allies under that nuclear umbrella? The idea was, would this, again, prevent the spread of communism? Sure. This would help to prevent the spread of communism. So that's massive retaliation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's the picture of a, it's not a real mushroom cloud. There is a face in there. Is that coincidentally? No. 
Um, that was intentional. Uh, in any case, folks, is this going to make the war hotter or colder? Is this going to make the war hotter or colder, folks? Hotter. Is this uh, colder in that you assume that we're not going to go to war, but are we eventually going to go to war anyway? I mean, wars will happen, and so this makes it hotter. Okay. We also believe in something called brinkmanship. Brinkmanship. And what brinkmanship said is that America would not back down. America would never back down, even if it meant bringing the nation to the brink of war. America would never back down, even if it meant bringing the nation to the brink of war. America would never back down, even if it meant bringing the nation to the brink of war. I'll give you an example. Are you guys familiar with the game Chicken? Okay, let me explain the game Chicken. So you have this, uh, let's say this cliff, okay? And you have two cars up here. There's one car. Assume the other car is behind it. Okay? The idea is in order to prove that you're tough, you know, you're going to both get in your cars and, you know, I'm going to put my entire family in mine and you can put the entire family in his and we're going to drive as fast as we can towards that cliff. And whoever breaks first is what? Chicken. And so America says, I want to know, I'm not going to break until you break. I will drive over that cliff if we have to. I will kill everyone if we have to. But I am not going to break. You break first. And so America says, I'm willing to drive over that cliff. I'm willing to go to nuclear war because I will never back down until you back down. And so again, is America posturing here? Is America trying to look tough and say, I am the toughest country, and you will not push me around, Soviet Union. If you bring a gun, I'll bring a gun. In fact, I'll bring two guns. And so you'll have to bring two guns too? Well, I'm gonna bring three guns then. And I will bring a nuclear weapon. I'll bring a thousand nuclear weapons until you back down. I'll kill us all. I don't care. I'll do it. I'm crazy. <laughs> But that's what America is saying. We're willing to go to the brink of war. So is that foreign policy going to make the war hotter or colder? Hotter. Again, it's making us push us closer and closer to war. Well, folks, if we ever did actually go to war, uh, who would lose? Everyone would lose because we believed in something called mutually assured destruction. Guys, if a nuclear war ever broke out, it would result in MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction, which is why it's called MAD. Because if there's a nuclear war, then we'll have Mutually Assured Destruction, and is that crazy? Is going to nuclear war crazy, guys? Because everyone dies. It's MAD. It's crazy. Everybody dies in that scenario. And so as much as we're posturing and posturing and saying, I'm tough, I'm powerful, I will, you know, I will attack you, the secret in everyone in the military's mind is, if we go to war, does everybody die? Everybody dies, even on our side. And the truth is, this wasn't really a secret. We saw how powerful the bomb was, so do the American people know that if we go to nuclear war, most people will die? And are they afraid of that? Well, they're nervous about the idea of nuclear war. They're nervous of the idea of being killed by the Soviets and their nuclear bombs. By the way, not nuclear missiles yet. We're not there yet. But we're afraid of nuclear bombs killing us. And so, the president and uh, the American government said, you know, we got to make our people feel better. There's something that we got to do to make people feel more at ease with, you know, this threat of war. I know what we'll do. We'll make them feel better because the reality is, if we are attacked by the Soviet Union, guys, I mean, they're going to attack us once they get past this threshold. This is the by the time we know that they're coming. We'll only have only so long before you know we know that they're coming. And even if we know that they're coming, we might not be able to get out in time. And so a Soviet attack is going to kill everyone. So we have to understand what the response would be. And so we decide to create something called civil defense. We decide to create something called civil defense. And civil defense was created to make the public feel secure. 
it was designed to make the public feel safe. If there's a nuclear attack, folks, do we have a plan? Yes, that's the idea. Civil defense was supposed to make the American public feel safe and secure because it gave the impression that there was a plan for nuclear war. It gave people the impression that there was a plan for nuclear war. Don't worry, folks, there's radio fallout. All these people will take care of you. Civil defense will take care of you because they promoted the creation of bomb shelters. They created bomb shelters to make people feel better. They created bomb shelters to make people feel better. Furthermore, again, here's more bomb shelters. The basic idea was if there's a nuclear blast, don't worry. If you go into your bomb shelter, you'll be fine. Here's another one. And here's another one. But did people feel more secure knowing that maybe there was a place to go if there was a nuclear attack? People felt so much better knowing that, oh my, the, the government has created fallout shelters for all of us, or at least for most of us, and we can hide in there and this will protect us from a nuclear war. The government's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry, just go into the fallout shelter and you'll be fine. The reality, folks, is that if you're within like a three, four mile radius of that blast, this will not protect you. This will not protect you at all. You're still gonna die. And again, this is a metal container, guys. So if the temperature jumps up to what, like 21,000 degrees, you're gonna bake. It's like an oven. You're gonna die anyway. And if you're close enough, this metal is not gonna stop a nuclear bomb. Are you kidding me? So the idea was, this really didn't do anything. But did it make people feel better? It made people feel so much better, even though it didn't do anything. I mean, we gave around things like this, this is what we gave to people it's from civil defense, as you can see here. And the idea was we would give these, uh, what do you call these? Yeah, these uh, are radio, uh, radio instruments. And the idea was you would be able to detect radiation. So if you felt uncomfortable at all, like you'd have civil defense workers walking around all the time trying to detect radiation. See if there's any radiation around just in case that there might be a bomb or a dirty bomb. You give this to families. And if you're in a shelter, you'd be like, let's see if there's still radiation out there. You go put it up. Oh, there's still radiation. We've got to stay in the shelter. But the basic idea was these kinds of instruments and tools were designed to make people feel better. But the reality is it wasn't going to save you. And the government knew that, folks. And so we purposely underfunded these programs because we knew it wasn't going to do anything. But did it make people feel better? Yeah. But it's not going to do anything. It's not at all. For example, if you know that ninjas are invading La Puente, there's ninjas everywhere. Stealing stuff, whatever else, killing people. We know that ninjas can get anywhere. But they say, you know what? Just put a second lock on your door and you'll be fine. Is that going to stop a ninja? Absolutely not. A second lock wouldn't stop a ninja. But do people feel better? <coughs> no. You put neighborhood watch out there. Oh, don't worry. We'll watch out for ninjas. Is that going to stop a ninja? An old lady with a flashlight? No. But people feel better knowing that someone is watching. And so again, we had it, we didn't fund it, because we knew it was a waste of time. But again, bomb shelters, makes you feel better. The other thing that we did, we created educational programs and children's songs. We created educational programs and children's songs to make parents and children feel better. So don't worry folks, if there's a nuclear blast, all you have to do is duck and cover. And that'll save you from a nuclear blast. No, it's not going to save you from a nuclear blast. But now, might it save you if you're far enough away? Sure. But again, if there is a nuclear blast, folks, this is not really going to do anything at all. But it made people feel better. Now, there was a uh, joke a while ago on a cartoon where uh, it was making fun of Duck and Cover, where there was a volcano that was erupting and lava was like coming over. And they're like, quick, the lava's coming, Duck and Cover. So like, they got on their knees and they Duck and Covered. Uh, put their hands over the head, and then the lava came and just rolled right over them because they're duck and covering. Like, oh, thank God for duck and cover. That lava could have killed us, but because we duck and covered, it formed a protective shield that made to the lava to roll over us. But that's how ridiculous duck and cover is. It's not going to protect you from a nuclear blast, but again, it made people feel better. So let's watch a quick video of duck and cover. Dum, dum, little dum, dum. 
be like Bert, and there is a flash, duck, and cover, and do it fast. Here are some older boys showing what to do if the flash comes when you are not in the classroom. This is what to do if you should be in a corridor. You duck and cover tight against the wall this way. Remember to keep your face and the back of your neck covered tightly. Try to fall away from windows or doors with glass in them. Then, if the glass breaks and flies through the air, it won't cut you. You might be eating your lunch when the flash comes. Duck and cover under the table. Then, if the explosion makes anything in the room fall down, it can't fall on you. Getting ready means we will all have to be able to take care of ourselves. The bomb might explode when there are no grown-ups near. Paul and Patty know this, and they are always ready to take care of themselves. Here they are on their way to school on a beautiful spring day, but no matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover. Paul and Patty know what to do. Paul covered the back of his head so that he wouldn't be burned, and Patty covered herself with the coat she was carrying. They knew how to duck and cover. They acted right away when the flash came. If they had been at this doorway when the bomb flashed, Paul and Patty would have ducked and covered this way, like this girl. Teddy doorways are a good place to duck and cover. She will be safer, too. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He's ready for it. Duck and cover. Have a boy, Tony. That flash means packed fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. Tony knew what to do. Notice how he keeps from moving or from getting up and running. He stays down until he is sure that it's over. The man helping Tony is a civil defense worker. His job is to help protect us when there is danger of being bomb. We must obey the civil defense worker. We must know how to duck and cover in the school bus or in any other bus or streetcar. Duck and cover. Don't wait. Duck away from the windows fast. The glass may break and fly through the air and cut you. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. <laughs> this family knows what to do, just as your own family should. They know that even a thin cloth helps protect them. Even a newspaper can save you from a bad burn. But the most important thing of all is to duck and cover yourself, especially where your clothes do not cover you. No matter where we live, in the city or the country, we must be ready all the time for the atomic bomb. Duck and cover. That's the first thing to do, duck and cover. The next important thing to do after that is to stay covered until the danger is over. Yes, we must all get ready now so we know how to save ourselves if the atomic bomb ever explodes near us. If you do not know just what to do, ask your teacher when this film is over. Discuss what you could do in different places if a bomb explodes. Older people will help us as they always do. There might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes. Then, you're on your own. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? So as ridiculous as that is, the reality is that to some degree it does have some value. If you're far enough away from the blast, then yeah, you probably should duck and cover because you will get burned to death. I mean, you will either, I mean, you will get sunburned at least. And if you're close enough, it doesn't really make a difference because you will be set on fire or you will be deatomized. But if you're far enough away, you want to duck and cover because one, if you are looking at the blast, you will go blind and two, you will have severe burns. And so that's something you want to avoid. But nonetheless, duck and cover, it's not going to save people for the most part. If you're far enough away, sure. But if you're uh, like on the bus, if that blast was going to break glass, then that bus is going to start rolling. Like really, that, that blast would start rolling that bus and most of those kids will be injured or killed anyway. And so the reality is, in a nuclear blast, it's a lot worse than what they perceive it to be or make it look. But the goal of duck and cover was to make people, again, 
feel secure. The goal was to make people feel safe. This is not really going to save people's lives, but did parents feel a little bit better knowing that there was a plan? Did kids feel better knowing that there was a plan? And based on this film, I mean, hell, if there's a blast, I mean, that turtle did fine. Why shouldn't I? I just had to duck and cover. That's simple. That's easy. I can remember that. And when there's an actual blast, you will duck and cover, and you will likely die. But at least up until that point, you felt secure. So, you know, sucks. We also have the National Emergency Alarm Repeater, another program designed to warn people. Uh, and so the basic idea is you have your air sirens, obviously. But then also you had a National Emergency Near Alarm Repeater where it would signal when a bomb was coming. So you could use that if you're not near a siren, and then uh, you could go inside a bomb shelter. But yeah, the reality is if you know bombs are coming, they're like five minutes away, uh, that's not really going to save you. Because, I mean, it take you five minutes to get out of LA. More than that, you're going to die. And the new hydrogen bombs will destroy a 20 mile radius. So you try running out of a radius of 20 miles. Good luck with that. So there's that. <coughs> In any case, all of that stuff going on, folks. What you should note is that with massive retaliation, with bringmanship, with uh, rollback, Eisenhower ultimately rejected the containment policy because he believed that not destroying communism was immoral. He believed that not destroying communism was immoral. He believed that not destroying communism was immoral. And so he's obviously going to get more aggressive in his foreign policy. But again, he rejected containment because, again, what does containment not do? Destroy. It just lets it stay. He says, why are we going to let it stay? We've got to get rid of that. And so in order to get rid of that communism, <coughs> he decides to change the military. And so he creates what becomes known as the New Look Military. The New Look Military. And the idea of this new look military is that we would have less army and more air force. We would have a smaller army and a bigger air force. And the idea was, one, this was to save us a lot of money. Because who no longer do we have to pay? Soldiers. And besides, this new foreign policy, is it going to be using soldiers anyway? Are we going to use soldiers to fight against communists? No, what are we going to use? Massive retaliation, folks. What are we going to use in the event of any aggression? Nuclear, Nuclear bombs. So do we need soldiers? Not really. So we reduce our army, increase our air force, and in fact, what you see is a shift. And you see this shift into the creation of what becomes known as Strategic Air Command. Strategic Air Command was a fleet of super bombers carrying nukes. It was a fleet of super bombers carrying nukes. So again, Strategic Air Command, or SAC, was a fleet of super bombers carrying nukes. And the idea was these nukes would be all over the place. I mean, these planes would fly all across the world. And in the event of an attack, they could attack pretty quickly, these super bombers. And so what you see a change of is an increase in nuclear weapons. You see an increase in nuclear weapons and a decrease in conventional weapons or conventional war. So you increase in nuclear weapons and a decrease in conventional weapons. What is conventional? Handguns, grades, tanks, whatever. Anything that's not nuclear is conventional. So non-nuclear is the same as conventional. But conventional war is war with soldiers, tanks, planes, bombs, whatever. Nuclear war is nuclear weapons. And we call it conventional because conventional typically means like that makes sense, that's reasonable, rational. Nuclear war is never rational, it's never reasonable. And so we use conventional weaponry, but we use less of it now uh, in this new world. Um, so yeah, 
I mean, there's this emphasis on nuclear weapons, conventional, whatever else. And so here we are again using more planes and bombs to attack the Soviets and the Chinese. The idea was <coughs> this was supposed to give us more bang for the buck. The idea was that it was supposed to give us more bang for the buck. Because by investing in bombers, nuclear submarines, and eventually missiles, which we'll have in the future, we could focus more on nuclear missiles and less on what? What do we have to pay less? Soldiers, troops. How many people do you need to uh, shoot a nuclear weapon? Like three, four? How many? Let me give you an example. How many bombs does it take to destroy a city? One. How many soldiers do you think it would take to destroy a city? A lot. Several planes, several soldiers, several, you know, several losses and casualties. So we figured we get more bang for the buck. Now you pay a soldier, you know, for 30 years that they're in the army, you build one nuclear weapon, that's one city gone. And so the idea was this will give us the ability you know, to reduce our military costs while giving us more firepower. So more bang for the buck. So this becomes our new look military. Less soldiers, more nuclear weapons. Less soldiers, more planes. Make sense so far, folks? That's the new look. Because again, this is in line with what foreign policy? What is our foreign policy again under Eisenhower? Rollback and what's massive retaliation? Massive retaliation is the use of nuclear weapons. Because this, again, will be the new foreign policy that we have. They're going to leave the front. We don't really need soldiers anymore. We just need planes to bomb the crap out of the Soviet Union and China. Now, something you don't have to know, but it's kind of interesting, is Project Furtherance. This won't be on the AP test, but I think it's kind of cool. So, knowing that nuclear weapons were more of a threat, and knowing that the Soviets and the Chinese would take any advantage that they could, there was a top secret plan called Project Furtherance uh, issued during uh, the Eisenhower administration. And the plan was this. If there ever was an attack and the president went missing or was killed, the military was to immediately launch all nuclear weapons at China and the Soviet Union. It didn't matter who attacked us. If there was an attack on the US and the president is missing or killed, we have to launch all of our nuclear weapons at China and the Soviet Union. And again, it didn't matter if China attacked us or the Soviet Union attacked us. We kill them both. We destroy both of them. Because the fear was if they knew that the president was missing, they would know that America was weak, and they would begin to launch an attack on us full scale. So we argued this is the time to attack them now because they'll probably attack us anyway. If the president goes missing or is killed, we must launch all nuclear weapons at China and the Soviet Union. By the way, this included if the attack was by accident, but if the president is killed, we kill all of our enemies with us. And by the way, that'll result in nuclear war. Because the second they know that our bombs are released, they'll launch their bombs too. But Project Furtherance was if we kill, if the president gets killed, we kill everyone else. And that's kind of how that works. Luckily, by 1967, Johnson decided this was a bad policy because it would mean the end of the world. So we get rid of it. But for a good, a good 17 years, guys, this is the policy of the US. If the president gets killed, kill everyone else. Scary. When Eisenhower eventually does step down, he gives what is known as his farewell address, much like George Washington. And what he did is that he warned about the growth of the military industrial complex. <coughs> he warned about the growth of the military industrial complex. Again, he warned about the growth of the military industrial complex. And what this meant was that the military had too much influence on the economy. The military had too much influence on the economy. The basic idea was the more wars we go on, the more, the more wars that we fight, what's going to happen to the U.S. economy? What will happen to the U.S. economy if we fight more wars? Will it get better or worse? Why worse? 
Why better? Jobs. Jobs. And so the problem was the military was too connected, had too much influence on the economy. And so if more wars means a better economy, will more Americans maybe want to fight more wars? And so that was the fear, that this military had far too much influence on the US economy. It would make us a warring nation, which we did not like the idea of. And so you had that. The other criticism he had of this military industrial complex, this military economy complex, was that we spent more money on weapons and not enough on our people. We spent too much on weapons and not enough on our own people. So he's quoted as saying, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. The idea being, we're spending millions, billions, on nuclear weapons, and yet we can't feed our own kids. We have poor in our own country, and we feel like it's better to create one more nuclear weapon than send you know, 100 kids to school. That seems crazy to me. So he says we probably should step back from this military industrial complex, even though it was his policy to create it to begin with. Make sense? He just feel like, OK, I'm wrong. It got too big in my uh, farewell address. I feel like maybe we should step back from that and reevaluate. But in any case, uh, that's what he says when he steps down. That doesn't mean that we're done with Eisenhower. This is just what he was doing domestically. Issues that Eisenhower dealt with in other countries included Vietnam. Now again, this is not the Vietnam War. This is Vietnam. Vietnam War doesn't begin yet. But let's talk about Vietnam. How did we address the issue in Vietnam? Here's what's happening in Vietnam. The communist, the communist leader, Ho Chi Minh, was fighting against what colonial power? Which European country controlled Vietnam up until this point? The French. Very good. So Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader in Vietnam, fought against French colonial control. They want independence. And that's cool. That makes sense. They fought against French colonial rule. Well, at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the communists defeat the French. The communists defeat the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. And uh, yeah, things are bad. Well, that means Vietnam, I mean, North Vietnam has become communist. And we decide to s divide Vietnam at the 17th parallel. Once the French are kicked out, they decide to divide Vietnam at the 17th parallel. North Vietnam will be led by Ho Chi Minh. And they will be what kind of government? Communist. By the way, why does North Vietnam become communist? Why are they communists and not South Vietnam? Because China is bordering them. And so that's a major reason why. So North Vietnam will become communist, led by Ho Chi Minh. They're communist leaders. And they divide Vietnam at the 17th parallel. In South Vietnam, No Dinh Dien becomes the leader of South Vietnam. And what kind of government do they have? Democratic or capitalist government. They have a democratic or capitalist government in South Vietnam. Now, you might be wondering, well, why did they split Vietnam in half already? Well, the Americans and the French and everyone else promised to have countrywide elections. They promised to have countrywide elections to determine a national government. So temporarily, we were supposed to have a South Vietnam and a North Vietnam, but were they eventually supposed to be united? That was the goal. Like, for now, we'll have them govern the South. You govern the North, the North, but they promised countrywide elections to unite the country. Well, we never had those countrywide elections. The countrywide elections were never held. And the reason why they were never held is that the Americans knew that if we have an election, who's going to win? 
why don't we want to have elections? Because we know that who's going to win? Communists. And we say, oh, this election will not go our way. So we don't have the elections. We refuse to have elections because we know we're going to lose. And instead, America continues to support no Din Diem. So he gains U.S. support, even though he does not have free elections. And I should also note that no Din Diem is a military dictator. He's a military dictator in South Vietnam. He kills any potential communists. He's very rich while the rest of the country is poor. He tries to make them Catholic even though most of them are Buddhist. I mean, he's a military dictator and he kills people left and right, political prisoners, that kind of thing. But the Americans support him, even though he's a military dictator. Why? Because he's our military dictator. We're willing to let this guy kill his own people so long as he's pro-American. We'll let him do that. So long as he prevents what? Communism. So we will turn a blind eye. We'll say, you know what? Go ahead and do whatever you need to. Kill those people if you got to. Just so long as communism doesn't spread, we're cool. We're completely okay with that. And so, is America being a bit hypocritical here? Sure, but we don't care. The reality is, if communism spreads, that's a bad thing in my eyes. So maybe we said we're going to give them free elections, but guess what? We're not. We lied. But I would rather have all those people killed than have communism spread in South Vietnam, because that was a serious threat. So North Vietnam is obviously not happy about this. Neither is China or Russia, because they knew that communism was going to spread. And America does fear that there might be a war here, because was there a war in Korea under the same situation? Sure. So what America creates is CETO. America creates CETO. And CETO is created very much like what? NATO. CETO is created similar to NATO. And this Southeast Asia Treaty Organization was a military alliance to prevent communism in Southeast Asia. It was a military alliance to prevent the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. And the reason why we were so concerned about the spread of communism in Southeast Asia, the reason why we were so concerned about the spread of communism in Southeast Asia was because of the domino theory. The argument that what? Yes. If one country falls to communism, all of its neighbors will fall to communism. And so can we let Vietnam fall? According to domino theory, no. If Vietnam falls to communism, all its neighbors will also fall to communism. So domino theory forced America to become more aggressive in this region, which is why we'll eventually join uh, the Vietnam War, but not yet. But this is the reason why America gets more involved in this region. Because look at those countries. Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, India, Bangladesh. Are these wealthy countries? No. And so all these countries, is it, are these countries that might be prime for communism? Yeah, communism would easily spread in these countries. So America says, look, if we let Vietnam fall, they'll all fall. And that's going to be a problem for America. So domino theory. Now things are getting bad, so we try to make things better. And in 1953, things get really good for America. America finally gets lucky here. Because uh, an event makes the Cold War a lot cooler. Whose death makes the Cold War a lot cooler in 1953? Stalin. Stalin dies in 1953, and America thinks, oh, thank God. Because he was crazy. Stalin would have killed everyone. And so now we think, oh my gosh, finally, he's dead. Now we can deal with someone that might be a bit more rational, because Stalin was crazy. He was. He was a megalomaniac. He was going to kill everyone if he had to. And so Stalin's dead. Is that going to make the world hotter or cooler? Cooler. cooler. We're going to cool down tensions. 
And Nikita Khrushchev, he takes control of the Soviet Union. Nikita Khrushchev, he's appointed to be the leader of the Soviet Union in 1955. And uh, he's going to make things cooler because he promotes a philosophy called peaceful coexistence. Peaceful coexistence. And in his uh, philosophy, what don't we have to do? We don't have to fight. We don't have to kill each other. Can we coexist peacefully? You know, half the world communism, half the world democracies. Yeah, why not? Why can't we do that? You know, he said, I'm sure we could live without killing each other. I'm sure that's possible. So he promoted peaceful coexistence. And he said, rather than trying to kill each other, we should compete economically. He promoted economic competition, saying, let the best economy win. And he said, we're not going to fight with weapons. We should fight with our economies. Because if more economies become successful with communism, then does communism win? Sure, and vice versa with capitalism. But he said, let us compete economically. We don't have to kill each other. We don't have to like each other. But we can try this out. And we'll naturally people decide for themselves which one's better. But they're clear winners. That's the idea. And he said, we will bury you economically. Not with weapons, but we will bury you economically. Not militarily, but economically we will bury you. Now this agreement, this peace that we uh, tried to broker between the two countries, um, see here is the American people shaking the hands of the Soviets. But what is the difference between the Americans and the Soviets? What's the difference there in this picture? Yeah, Cordell. The American people are under control of the government. Exactly. The American people are making that choice willingly. Whereas the agreement we're making is with the Soviet government is that agreement made with the Soviet people. Now, the people are forced to go along with whatever the, whatever the government says because they're handcuffed. So and that's the argument there. But again, cooler, much better. Then we have the Geneva Summit in 1955. And uh, Khrushchev and Eisenhower meet here. And they do two things. Number one, they sign the Open Skies Agreement. And the Open Skies Agreement allowed for mutual aerial monitoring. Mutual aerial monitoring of nuclear stockpiles. It allowed for mutual aerial monitoring of nuclear stockpiles in the Open Skies Agreement. It allowed for mutual aerial monitoring of nuclear stockpiles. The basic idea being, uh, America will feel a lot more comfortable if we can fly over your country just to see if you're not building a crazy amount of nuclear weapons. And the Soviet Union said, yeah, us too. So every so often, we can fly over each other's countries to make sure that the other country is not overproducing. Does that make sense? So like that way, we know that Russia didn't secretly make 10,000 more nuclear weapons, because if we did, would America have to catch up? Yeah, so this way, we do aerial monitoring. The reality, though, is that this wasn't going to do very much, because it required like pre-clearance or required notice before they could fly over, like a seven-day notice. So in seven days, if I say, hey, we're going to fly over your country next week, what could you do in those seven days? Hide all your stuff. So it wasn't very effective, but again, was it designed to make things better? Sure, I mean, yeah, it wasn't going to actually do anything, but it made relations better. It cooled the tensions more. The other thing they agreed to at the Geneva summit, though, was they both agreed that nuclear weapons were a threat, or that nuclear weapons were a threat to the world, which is a good thing. Rather, they both agreed that they should disarm nuclear weapons. They both agreed to disarm the nuclear weapons. Eventually. Which is key. But they both agreed to disarm the nuclear weapons eventually because they're dangerous. Now, are they going to do it right away? No. But do they now recognize at least that the weapons that they're creating are crazy? And that's the first step. First step is realizing you have a problem. The nuclear weapons are going to kill everyone. Then you start doing something about it. But they said, OK, at least we recognize that what we've been doing is probably not what's best for the rest of the world. So we need to start stepping back from that. 
So again, have the relationships gotten better between the two? Have tensions cooled? Have we pushed ourselves away for more? Sure, it looked like things were getting good. And then things got bad with the Hungarian uprising. Here's what happened. In 1956, the Hungarians had a revolution. They fought for democracy and independence. They had a revolution fighting for democracy and independence. Now, why did they have this revolution? And the answer is because they were inspired by America's position to free people from communism. They were inspired by America's position to free people from communism. They had a revolution because America said what? If you have a revolution, what? We'll help you. We will come and help you. So they were inspired by America's position to free people from communism. If you fight against communism, we will help you. I mean, we've been saying it through Radio Free, Ameri Radio Free Europe, Voice of America. We've been promoting this idea for years. Revolt and we'll be there by your side. And so they revolt. And the Soviets send in the tanks. And the Americans send nothing. The Americans send nothing. They send no aid and Hungary becomes a slaughterhouse. The Soviets send in the military and kill tens of thousands of protesters. They murder people left and right. They destroy the government and put up a puppet government, but they kill everyone who tries to protest against the Soviet control. And America just stood back and did nothing. Now, what did America promise to do if ever any of their friends or allies uh, faced any Soviet aggression, what were we going to do? Help them, and we were going to help them how? If there is aggression against us or our allies, what are we as a country going to do? What is our foreign policy? We're going to bomb them. It's massive retaliation. But did we perform massive retaliation? No. Massive retaliation failed. And the reason why massive retaliation failed is if we nuke Russia over this, what is Russia going to do? Nuke us back. And what it came down to was that America was not willing to go to war over Hungary. We just weren't. We're not going to go to war over Hungary. You want me to risk the lives of 150 million Americans over Hungary? Really? What has Hungary done for me lately? And so we were not willing to go to war over Hungary. And as a result, massive retaliation failed. Were we all talk? Yeah. We were scared to actually take any action here because of mad guys. If we did defend Hungary, would we have died? Would we have lost? Would everyone have been killed? Sure. And so this foreign policy was recognized to be a failure because in reality, we could not respond. We didn't have the capability to respond. We were too afraid to respond. I know we said we're going to use nuclear weapons, but now that we're in that situation, we realized maybe not. Not for Hungary, anyway. And so instead of sending troops, we sent our apologies. But is that going to do them any good? And America looked like a fraud. You know, America lied. These people stake their lives on America helping them. And then when they finally, you know, revolted like America said they should, America said, uh, actually, never mind. We're not going to come and help you. Not good, guys. Not good at all. And so again, like I said, massive retaliation is a major failure. Another major failure on our part is Sputnik. In 1957, the Soviets launched a missile with a satellite into space. In 1957, the Soviets launched a satellite into space before we did. 
And the problem is, if the Soviets can launch a uh, satellite into space on a missile, what else can they put on that missile? A nuclear warhead. And what can that nuclear warhead be aimed at? America. So this becomes a major issue. In 1957, the Soviets launched a satellite into space on a missile. And unfortunately, that missile can now attack America. Let's take a look. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here, an artist's conception of how the feat was accomplished. A three-stage rocket. Number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile. Its weight estimated at 50 tons. So real quick, you see that missile there? That's carrying a satellite. But the problem is if they can shoot something all the way into space, what can they now also shoot? Us. They can shoot us. And if you can put a satellite at the tip of that missile, you could put a nuclear weapon at the tip of that missile. And this is the problem. They now can shoot us, but we can't shoot them. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. But that beeping that you're hearing, guys, was terrifying. Because that beeping meant that any time now the Soviets could drop a nuclear warhead over us. Because if they can shoot it all the way above us and that thing can circle the world, so can a missile circle the world and land right on top of us. And we did not have that capability. And people said, well, what the hell are we doing? Why didn't we develop this technology? Now, why were we so complacent? Why did we let the Soviets get there first? Because this, folks, was a serious problem. Because now, we had a missile gap. The Soviets could attack us, and we couldn't attack them back. Guys, before, in the bomber age, it would take us about 10 hours to attack each other. To fly a plane from America all the way to the Soviet Union would take about 10 hours. To fly a plane and drop a bomb. There would be warning systems, so at least we would know that they were coming, and they would know we were coming. And if we knew that they were attacking, you know, they would warn us, and we could send our planes also, and vice versa. But now there's a missile age, and they got to it first. Instead of taking 10 hours for them to attack us, they can now attack us in 35 minutes. That's not good. Now those warning systems will give us no time at all to be able to run away from a nuclear warhead. And if we do shoot them, normally it would have taken them 10 hours to attack us, but it only take them 35 minutes. So here we are, having our planes flying over. They'll detect us, and they'll launch their nuclear warheads and hit us while our planes are still flying over to hit them. By that time, could they also shoot down our planes? And they would have also killed us by that time. And so the missile gap is a problem because we have no ability to strike them quickly. We have no ability to. And so could the Soviets attack us at any time? Yeah, and they would win because we can't hit them back. It would take us at least a few hours. It would take them 35 minutes to attack us because their missiles can go upwards of 5,000 miles per hour. Our planes, what, seven, 800 miles per hour? We're screwed. So this becomes a serious problem. So how do we combat this issue of a missile gap? Well, we do a few things. We create the National Defense Education Act. And the basic idea is that we're gonna send college students to study science, math, engineering, and also foreign languages. Why foreign languages, by the way? Spies. Spies, that kind of thing. But science, math, engineering, 
We're going to train them in science, math, engineering, and the hope is that they enter the weapons industry or they enter weapons research to develop these new missiles, this new technology. So the expectation is that they will enter weapons research. Well, they eventually do enter weapons research. We get a lot more people trying to play catch up with the Soviet Union. And when we finally do, in 1958, uh, America launches Explorer 1 into space. We're like, yay, we did it. We caught up. In 1958, we launched Explorer 1 into space. But is this, are the Soviets already a year ahead of us? Yeah, they're already launching like bears and rats and pigs into space and monkeys just to see how it, it would impact you know, a human body. And so they're already a year ahead of us. And so now we're just playing catch up because they're way above us. And so now we have to play catch up with the Soviets again. And you see us create NASA. And NASA will be created to again slowly begin the space race. And you guys again understand the idea, right? If we can launch something into space, can we launch things at the Russians? That's the basic idea. If it can go into space, it could go back and hit the Russians as well. Fun fact, because the Russians were so far ahead of us, we thought, well, okay, maybe we can't get someone on the moon anytime soon. Uh, maybe we can't even get someone into space. But what we can try to do is we can nuke the moon first. And so there was an American plan for some time to actually nuke the moon. The idea was that we would launch a nuclear weapon at the horizon of the moon where the sun and like the, the non-sun side meet. We would launch it there, and the idea was that if we nuke it, this massive mushroom cloud would be seen by the entire world to show our superiority and our ability to nuke the moon. And if we can nuke the moon, we can nuke anyone on planet Earth. We realized though this would piss off everybody because we don't own the moon, it's not ours. And so if we nuke the moon, which all of humanity owns, that would probably make a lot of people angry. So we decided against that. Also, there was a fear that if we nuke the moon, it might crack the moon or blow it out of orbit or destroy it completely. Because we didn't know what would happen to the moon if we nuked it. We also didn't know what would happen if we detonated a nuclear weapon in space. What reaction would that create? And so we just decided maybe we should not do this. And so they didn't. But there was a time when we thought nuking the moon was a good idea. Then there's the ultimatum on Berlin. Khrushchev is in a position of power right now because, again, we have, they have a missile and we are just developing ours. And so Khrushchev gives an ultimatum. He orders all Western powers to leave Berlin. He orders all Westerners to leave Berlin. Or else what? Go kill them. What does America say? No way. Khrushchev orders the Westerners to leave Berlin. Or else. Or else usually meaning we'll kill everyone. America refuses, saying we will not leave these people behind. We will not abandon them. We will not back down. We will not let communism spread to Berlin. And so does America feel, and does the world feel like we're going to go into war here? Yeah, I mean, it's right there. I mean, Berlin, again, is the hot spot. If America and the Soviets don't back down, everyone in the world is going to die again. And everyone's watching like, holy crap, we might die here because America refuses to leave Berlin and the Soviets are being unreasonable. Well, luckily, we avoid war because of the kitchen debates, literally. The kitchen debates were between Nixon and Khrushchev the vice president. And they literally met in like these very informal summits. They sat down, ate some cookies and milk, had dinner, and they debated their economies. They debated which economy was better. And at the end of the day, they just understood each other just a little bit better. And as a result, we did not kill each other. But again, they debated which economy was better. And at the end of the day, they understood each other, thus preventing war. Which is weird. 
But yeah, they just talked it out. Like, you know what I mean? I can understand why you're a communist. I can understand why you're a capitalist. But uh, we can't kill each other, man. Like, okay. Maybe we shouldn't kill each other. But yeah, kitchen debates. Saves the world. Cool. Then the U2 spy plane incident, which is not good. America was secretly spying on Russia. Are they allowed to do that? No. But they're secretly spying on Russia. And then the plane was shot down by Russia over Russia. The plane was shot down over Russia. So America's like, oh crap. They caught us. But America publicly said, nope, well, that's not our spy plane. I don't know who that is, but that's not ours. We lost a plane over Turkey somewhere, but that's not our spy plane. And Russia was like, oh, really? Because we have the spy plane. Like, uh, how do you know it's ours? We have the photos. That could be anybody's photos. We have your pilot. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's ours. But they shoot our plane out of the sky. They crash it. They catch it. And then they arrest the pilot. The pilot, by the way, was Captain Gary Powers. And he was arrested. Well, Captain Francis Gary Powers, but just Captain Powers. Cool name. In any way, in any case, uh, what ends up happening is that uh, this makes, uh, again, this makes peace between, or either it just increases tensions between the Soviets and the Americans, because the Americans were caught spying and like crap. Because now they know that this probably wasn't the first time we were spying. We've been spying a lot. And the reason why we didn't like this is that the Soviets did not have this technology yet, and now they do because they have our plane, which is not good. And so they have our plane. They can figure it. They can reverse engineer it, and now there's a problem. So Captain Gary Powers here. Fun fact: Captain Gary Powers had a silver nickel on him or silver dollar on him. It was a modified silver dollar, and it was modified because there was actually a needle in the dollar. Uh, and if you uh, ejected the needle, he would stab himself. Uh, because the needle had neurotoxins. And the idea was that if you were going to be tortured, or they were going to extract really important information from you, you were supposed to commit suicide. Which is pretty common for most CIA agents. If you're captured and they're going to torture you, or they're going to extract information you're not allowed to give them, then you're supposed to kill yourself. Luckily, he did not have to do that, and he was returned after like three months or so. But still, not good for America. And here's a Khrushchev like, oh, I see, this is the plane. Nice plane. Then Iran happened, or Iran. This is also a major issue. In 1953, the CIA overthrew the Iranian government. In 1953, the CIA overthrew the Iranian government, or they helped overthrow the Iranian government, and they placed the Shah of Iran in charge. And they put the Shah of Iran in charge. Shah, by the way, meaning king. And Iran before that uh, was a democracy that was becoming more communist, so we just overthrew their government. The CIA overthrew the government and they installed the Shah of Iran. The goal was to overthrow the communist government or the communist-leaning government. They weren't exactly communist. But the goal was to overthrow the communist-leaning government. That, by the way, was uh, democratically elected. Shah of Iran was a military dictator. Killed a lot of his own people. Tortured people. Murdered them. But that's okay. Why? Because he's our dictator, and he's preventing the spread of communism. So we're totally fine with him murdering people so long as he's murdering people that are... Uh, Communists. That's completely fine with us. Also, we like him because he's also going to give America access to what? In Iran. Oil. So we're completely fine with him being a military dictator so long as he stops the spread of communism and gives us oil. We have no qualms about it whatsoever. How do the Iranian people feel about him, though? They hate him. He kills them, tortures them. Uh, he takes away the religious rights. I mean, he's just a horrible person. And eventually, uh, jump ahead 20 years, 
There was a revolution called the Iranian Revolution. And in the Iranian Revolution, they overthrow the Shah. And the Shah flees to America. In 1970, you have the uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. He overthrows the government. It's a, rev it's a pretty much a religious revolution. And the Shah flees to America. Also, he's dying of cancer, so we start treating him for cancer. Now, the Iranian people want the Shah back. Like, no, 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 he can't run away. You give him back to us. Because he has to be tried for his crimes against our people. He killed people. He's a criminal. He's a war criminal. You have to give him back. And America said, what? Nope, not going to do that. You know, I know he killed your people, but uh, he's our guy. So we're not going to give him back. Even though we knew that he was a douche. We said, we're going to keep him. We're not going to give him to you. The Iranians hated the Americans for the saying the Americans were not denying them justice. So what did they do? Well, the Kumite, which is a leader, uh, pretty much a, the Iranian revolutionary, the Kumite, or I think it's spelled like this. I really don't know. I think it's spelled Kumite. I don't know. Uh, they decide to begin what becomes known as the Iranian hostage crisis. They attack the U.S. Embassy, and of the 60 employees, they take 54 hostage. They take 54 U.S. Embassy, US embassy workers hostage, or U.S. diplomats are held hostage. And they hold them hostage for a total of 444 days. The U.S. Embassy. And they hold 54 Americans hostage for over 444 days. They say, we will release them when you give us back the Shah. If you give us back the Shah, we'll release these 54 Americans. They were tried as spies, but none of them were killed. And the reason why none of them were killed was that the entire world was watching. They can't kill them because everyone is watching these 54 Americans. And if they do kill these people, will America have justification for invading? So they can't kill them. But if you notice, I said there were 60 people, and yet only 54 were held hostage. Six people escaped. And six people escaped, uh, and they hid in the Canadian ambassador's house, and we're like, well, how the hell do we get them out? Because if they are found by the Iranian revolutionaries, they'll kill them. These people are safe because the entire people are watching. But if those six people are captured, then you know what? They're going to be killed by the Iranian guard because they'll look like spies. They'll really look like spies. They've been hiding out, whatever else. And so we have a problem. And the other problem is that we shred all the documents, or as much of the documents as we could when the Iranians broke through the embassy. We try to shred everything. But the problem was the Iranian government was using sweatshop labor, like little kids, to take those shred pieces of paper and put them all back together. And so they were able to find out that there were 60 people and they only had 54. So they're like, six people are missing. And they kept a Facebook of all the people that worked in the embassy. And so even though all of those were shredded, they start putting these pictures back together and they find out we have these six people missing. And now they're looking for six people. And they don't know where they are. We have to get them out, otherwise it's going to be a problem. And one of the ways that we get them out is known as Operation Argo. Operation Argo was the way of getting these people out of Iran. The idea was that we were going to create a fake movie, a fake movie studio, and one CIA agent was going to go into Iran posing as a movie worker or movie executive and then leave with the six other Americans who would pretend to be directors, writers, uh, authors, whatever, and they would all leave together pretending that they all had gotten there at the same time. This is the premise of the movie Argo that just won Best Picture at the Oscars. It's an awesome movie. Really good. We should watch it. Not during the day, though. I mean, like, if you guys want to come after school and we watch it, I'd be all for that. I've seen it like five times. But I'm cool with watching it again. But no, it's a fantastic movie. This won't be on the AP test, by the way. But it's cool. It's Operation Argo. Um, but yeah, no, we should watch that movie one day. One day I'll just say, hey, come after school. I'm watching a movie. If you want to come, go ahead. But yeah, Argo, very good movie. In any case, so that happens. Then you have the Suez Crisis. Yeah, it's a cool movie. It won Best Picture. Very successful. 
movie. Oh, you mean the actual Operation Argo? Yeah. <laughs> also very successful. <laughs> it ended up being a really cool movie that won Best Oscar, Best Director. Suez Crisis. The Suez Crisis. Uh, what is the Suez Canal? What country is that? Israel? No way. Egypt. Here's what happened. In 1956, Egypt elected Gamal Abdul Nassar. Or Gamal Abdul Nasser, depending on who you talk to. But in 1956, the Egyptians elected Gamal Abdul Nasser. And what he did was he nationalized the Suez Canal. He nationalized the Suez Canal. And he nationalized the Suez Canal which was owned by British and French companies. He nationalized the Suez Canal, which was owned by British and French companies. What does it mean to nationalize? Make public. Make public? He seized it from them. He took it from them. He, made, he took it over. It was a government takeover. He seized it from the British and the French. And he said, this is ours now. Because you guys have been profiting from the Suez Canal for years, this canal belongs to the Egyptian people. So he seizes it. And how did England and France feel about that? Are they okay with that? Not so much. So what ends up happening is in October of that year, Israel, England, and France invade Egypt. By the way, they didn't tell America they were invading Egypt. It was a surprise invasion. Because America did not want to get involved. But they invade Egypt, and America's like, what are you doing? And America orders the British, French, and Israelis to withdraw. He orders them to withdraw. He says, I'm sorry, did you invade without my permission? Get out of Egypt. Because he didn't want another war. America did not want another war. And so they order the French, British, and Israelis to withdraw, saying, get out of Egypt. As far as I know, I didn't give you permission to invade. Now here's the thing, folks. America is telling England and France to get out of a country. What does that suggest about America's role in the world now? They're pretty powerful. If they can go around saying, hey, get out. Did, did, I, did I say that you could invade that country? Did I? No, don't talk back. Did I say you could invade that country, England and France? No, I did not. So if you want to be under the nuclear umbrella and continue to be my ally, you ask in the future. And if I say no, you live with it. Because in this new global landscape, are England and France a superpower anymore? No. America's in charge. And America responds with what becomes known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. And the Eisenhower Doctrine says, America will prevent the spread of communism in the Middle East. America will prevent the spread of communism in the Middle East. Not England, not France, not after breakfast, America. America will prevent the spread of communism in the Middle East, not England or France. Because we're cool like that. And you don't cross America. So is America kind of exercising its power here? Trying to put itself on the pedestal of I am awesome? Of course. Lastly, let's talk about Cuba. Okay, quick question here. If an actor was going to play Fidel Castro, which actor do you think should play Fidel Castro in a movie? Let's look at this guy real quick. Who does this look like to you? Like, spitting image, like they must be related. Who does this look like to you guys? The dad from Taken, exactly. Liam Neeson. Shouldn't Liam Neeson, the guy from Taken and Qui-Gon Jinn and you know, the guy from Love Actually, shouldn't he play Fidel Castro in some movie of sorts? 
because they look exactly the same? That's my argument. If there's a movie about Fidel Castro, which there probably will be now that he's almost dead, um, he's almost, Hugo Chavez died before he did. Hugo Chavez died yesterday. You guys know that? Yeah. Hugo Chavez died yesterday? That's a big deal. But, uh, yeah, if there's a movie about Fidel Castro, I think Liam Neeson should play Fidel Castro. And if there's a movie about Paul Revere, Jack Black should pay Paul Revere because they look exactly the same. Anyway, here's what happened. In 1959, Fidel Castro successfully takes over Cuba. You should probably note, if you don't already, that Fidel Castro is a communist. In 1959, Fidel Castro successfully takes over Cuba after a seven-year civil war. He takes it over. In doing so, he nationalizes ninety percent of Cuban mines and forty percent of Cuban sugar. He nationalizes ninety percent of Cuban mines and forty percent of Cuban sugar all of which were owned by America. So is America happy about this? For two reasons. One, they lost their money. Two, it's communist. So they nationalized 90% of mines, 40% of sugar, all of which are owned by Americans. And Americans are pissed. They're not happy. So do you think America is going to plot against Castro? Almost oh, definitely, because it's only like 80 miles away. That's a serious problem for us to have communism down there. So America begins to plot against Castro, and the Soviet Union welcomes Cuba into their nuclear umbrella. Is that good for America? No. So the Soviet Union welcomes Cuba into their nuclear umbrella. They welcome Cuba in their nuclear umbrella and they make the very famous statement. If America invades Cuba, we will shower them with missiles. If America invades Cuba, we will shower them with missiles. Terrifying. So can we invade Cuba? Nope. If America invades Cuba, we will shower them with missiles. So Cuba becomes communist under the protection of the Soviet Union, and this shows that what organization failed to prevent the spread of communism in Latin America? What was the name of that organization that was supposed to prevent the spread of communism in Latin America? The Organización de los Estados Americanos? Huh? No, not that. Not the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. That's Southeast Asia. Huh? NATO. Not NATO. That's North Atlantic. Uh, the OAS, the Organization of American States. This is a failure of the OAS, which is supposed to prevent the spread of communism. The Organización de los Estados Americanos. Organization of American States. Okay, that's Cold War politics under uh, Eisenhower. On Friday, we'll talk about his domestic policies. You have homework due on Monday. And don't forget, what should you bring on Friday? Money for your test. So if you're going to pay for your AP test this Friday, make sure you bring your money. And as always, make sure you do your homework. Have a good day, folks. I'll see you guys later.